Okay, so we'll, we'll start. Uh, members of Engineers Ireland, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you this evening. My name is John Byrne, and you're all very welcome to our inaugural lecture of the 2021 Sustainability Grand Tour. The Grand Tour itself is part of our overall National Recovery Initiative, and I'm delighted that our president, Morris Buckley, is here this evening to launch both the initiative and the Grand Tour. For our members, please note that this will count as one RCPD. Morris, you're very welcome to this evening's event, and I'd like to ask you now to open proceedings. Thank you, John. Um, you're all very welcome here to the, the first lecture in the 2021 Sustainability Grand Tour. And I believe the number of registrations is fantastic, well over 400. Um, so we're delighted that so many of you are on board tonight and I think you'll find it very interesting. And thanks to the Roads and Transportation Society, uh, our hosts this evening. You will remember the date because we are honored that Joe Biden, has chosen the start of the Engineers Ireland Sustainability Grand Tour for the start of his presidency tonight. Uh, maybe tongue in cheek, but it is, I think, a, a, an interesting coincidence because he is bringing great hope to America to start a new chapter. And we also in Engineers Ireland hope to start a very positive debate tonight about shaping the future of this country. Uh, these are tough times for all of our members um, and all of the Irish society dealing with COVID-19. We're right in the thick of it at the moment. But our responsibility as engineers is to plan ahead for our recovery and the next phase. How do we invest in stimulating the economy? What infrastructure do we develop? How do we better use the infrastructure we already have? Uh, all with a view to recovery, but also very much uh, sustainable recovery with an emphasis on sustainability. Uh, so one of the key Engineers Ireland's programs this year uh, for 2021 is our National Recovery Initiative, which I had the honour of launching last year back in June, and John Byrne, Sinead and the team, along with the Vice President John Power, who's chairing the Liaison Committee, have driven forward. It's a call to action, really, for all of our sectors, which are the regions, the divisions, the societies of Engineers Ireland, to put forward proposals for events and projects to address the challenges that we face in this country coming out of COVID-19 and dealing, of course, with the aftermath of Brexit and the economy. So two of the three proposals chosen will focus on webinars and panel discussions, the third on technology. So the first lecture series starting tonight is called the 2021 Sustainability Grand Tour and will consist of around 14 webinars and panel discussions to run primarily on consecutive Wednesdays from January through till April and focusing on climate action, the UN Sustainability Development Goals and the roles of the engineering sector in Ireland. Uh, it's a huge collaborative effort between different regions, the West region, the Cork region, Southeast, GB, Northeast, Northern and Midlands, sectors, the energy sector, environment and climate action, and then the Roads and Transportation Society, our hosts tonight. The second lecture series a little bit later is called the Brexit Lecture Series and will consist of four webinars and panel discussions focusing on areas such as the effects of Brexit on engineering education, cross-border procurement, and on Irish engineering in the UK. That will be a collaboration between the Northeast, GB, Northern, Northwest and Donegal regions. This lecture series will run from roughly from March to May this year with details to be announced shortly. And finally, the third project is the acquisition of a virtual site visit technology and the establishment of best practice for hosting virtual Engineers Ireland sector site visits and related events. And when we develop this, we'll make it available to all sectors so that many more people can participate in the really interesting site visits that uh, our sectors run on a regular basis. It's a significant pro project and it's a collaboration between the Thomond region and the Mechanical and Manufacturing Division. The project team are meeting weekly at the moment and the first dry run of this new technology is scheduled for the tail end of February. And I do wish the team and the project every success. So we look forward to all of that. But tonight, it's about roads and transportation and the first lecture of our tour. And I'd now like to hand over to the chair of the Roads and Transportation Society, Roy O'Connor, to introduce the first lecture of the series. Thank you. 
Great, thank you very much, Morris. And on behalf of the Roads and Transportation Society, uh, we're delighted to be hosting this first presentation here for the Sustainability Grand Tour. And uh, it is a good initiative. In fairness, I've really enjoyed meeting and collaborating with the various regional committee members uh, over the past few weeks where we're putting this series together. And as Morris says, we've got about 14 presentations lined up for you on a weekly basis at the moment. So hopefully you can tune into as many of those as you can. Um, it is a great platform for us to take a tour around the country and see the various current and recent projects that are going on in the various regions. And um, tonight we are starting off with three very experienced transportation engineers. We're going to present um, to you on the topic of optimizing sustainability through reallocating road space. And there's been a, a lot of that going on in recent months, particularly in my own area. So I'm very keen to see what these guys have to say. But before I introduce them, uh, the three speakers, um, I just want to highlight and hope that you've had an opportunity to note the various presentations that are coming up over the next few weeks. I think we have a slide there, Sinead. Thank you, just to, to, to show you uh, the schedule that's in place at the moment and maybe keep an eye on our website as well at Engineers Ireland and on Facebook. Uh, there may be minor changes, but we're fairly confident that's how it's going to run for the time being. I'd just like to use the opportunity as well to make you aware of one additional event and it ties in there on the 4th of March, and that's the annual seminar that the Roads and Transportation Society holds. Uh, as I said, it'll be on the 4th of March, leading up to World Engineers Day event, which will be in the afternoon. Um, this year, it's going to be a half day event from nine until one o'clock. It will be on the topic of mobility. And we're hoping to bring you an overview of changes in mobility patterns over the last year, as the impact on the sector and how we're adapting going forward. So we've been very promising lectures lined up there from some of the larger organizations and some of the consultants as well that are in, here in Ireland at the moment. So without further ado, we come on to the main um, event. <clears throat> it looks like we've got um, well over 300 um, attendees tonight, so it's certainly a testament to the collaboration of uh, this initiative. So um, the three speakers are going to talk to you each for about 15 minutes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we're going to follow that by a questions and answers session, which I'll do my best to moderate. So down the bottom of your um, Zoom screen there, you should have a Q&A tab. So if anyone has questions going through the, um, the various lectures or presentations, please just pop in your questions there. And myself, Sinead and Carl will triage those and I'll do my best then to present as many of those as I can to our panel of presenters. So Sean, just while you're getting ready there, um, our first speaker this evening is Sean McGrath. He's a senior engineer with the transportation department in Dunleary Rathdown County Council. So he's going to begin and show you what they've been doing for the last year, their strategy going forward, and the various challenges they've overcome in delivering some projects on the ground. This will be followed by uh, Rory Collins and Ben Errity, both senior engineers with Barry Transportation. And these are the guys who are at the nitty gritty of delivering the design of these projects and bringing them to construction on various um, uh, urban areas around the Dunleary Rathdown administrative area. So, jo Sean, uh, without further ado, if you'd like to share your screen there and we'll, we'll get it underway and um, I'll be back to you in 45 minutes or so. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Roy. Um... I'm uh, speaking on Zoom. I think this is my first time actually on Zoom. Uh, I normally use Teams in Dunleary Rathdown, and there's a one difference between the two platforms, which my daughter told me about. In uh, Teams, on the chat box, you have the opportunity for putting in emojis. So when she's at school and the teacher gives her some homework, all the class put in the angry face emoji uh, into the chat box. So I'm glad to say that that can't happen here. So I'm very confident I won't have any angry faces at the end of the day. Um, we'll start off by talking just a little bit about the background. Um, this time last year, nobody knew the phrase social distancing. And the COVID-19 has obviously been a huge impact in terms of identifying that. When it first came in, the idea of social distancing and keeping two meters apart, a lot of people thought it included, and still do, we all think it, it involves keeping two, distance, two meters distance when you're walking. It had a particular impact in, in terms of queuing at shops, either in the shops or on the way to try to get into shops. 
And one of the pictures I have on the right hand side there is Black Rock. And in Black Rock, there seem to be a huge number of coffee shops. And again, the huge number of people queuing outside of coffee shops was a huge issue. And ensuring that they had space on street for them to be able to queue at a safe distance from each other. Also around this time last year, uh, the, the idea of working from home took off with the shutdown that happened uh, in March of last year. And one of the uh, I suppose unpredictable effects of that was that there was a lot more local trips. Instead of people who'd be going to work in, say, the city centre, picking up the pint of milk or the litre of milk on the way home from work, now that would be a, a separate trip uh, and which would happen locally. Or going out for a coffee, again, that would happen locally. So there was a lot more walking and cycling in the locality um, from what it had been, say, six months previously. There's another issue as well, which provides input to the whole process, which was that the level of capacity in public transport was down at certain uh, times by 50% and at other times by 75%. And this means that people who still needed to commute or to travel had to find some sustainable way of doing so. And the sustainable ways of doing so are of course, walking and cycling. So that's all part of the background Before we got into the process, or as we were getting into the process, there were two pieces of guidance which were uh, distributed amongst, certainly amongst the local authorities and which were very useful. The first was from the National Transport Authority and it gave guidance on the legal basis for works. Again, a lot of people in the local authority sector will know that there are two main ways of progressing local authority development, uh, especially for traffic schemes. The first is section 38 of the Roads Act 1994 and the second is part eight of the Planning and Development Regulations 2001. So called section 38 and part eight uh, for short. And they each have advantages and disadvantages. Section 38, there's no requirement for public consultation. It's an executive function, which means that it's the officials, including engineers who decide on whether the go ahead is given or not. And there's no strict timelines in terms of when works are done. Part eight, however, is the alternative. Um, it has a requirement for public consultation. It has strict deadlines and timelines associated with that. And it is an executive function. In other words, it is a councillor to the final decision. In Dunleary Rathdown, we've used section 38 even before COVID-19. Uh, and Certainly as part of COVID-19, that's the one that we used for the works that we did. Part eight has its advantages in certain areas, but our, our um, normal practice, custom practices is to use section 38. The NTA guidance also identified section 46, subsection two of the Public Transport Regulation Act. And that clarified that when it comes to bus priority and cycle priority, that it is entirely permissible to use section 38. There had been some debate as to whether uh, these things could be done through section 38 or part eight, but the Plan Public Transport Regulation Act made it perfectly clear that section 38 is acceptable for the sort of pedestrian and cycle and pu public transport priority measures that we were introducing. The second piece of guidance, which was very helpful was DMORS, the uh, interim advice note uh, for DMORs. And that did uh, three things it brought back to our minds to focus on. One is to prioritize sustainable transport and the priority and the hierarchy is on the right hand side of the screen there with pedestrians and cyclists at the top of the priority list. A second thing is that it reminded us about universal design to make sure the places are accessible to everyone. And the third thing I talked about was having multidisciplinary teams. And this was something which was quite strong in our work in Dunleary Rathdown. The works, a lot of these works, all of these works are led by engineers, but there, there is a huge input in particular from the architects within the council, but also from planners and in some of the other works uh, with park superintendents and our communications office. So cutting across various disciplines as per the recommendations in the design manual for urban roads and streets. The funding 
funding comes from the National Transport Authority. Um, there are annual sustainable transport measures grants, and they were in place uh, over the last 20 or so years, and we had a significant amount of funding from that. But that predated the COVID-19 situation. There was an extra package under COVID-19 for specific COVID-19 related works. And then with the government's July job stimulus package, there was another source of funding. And I would just want to point out that the timelines on this were extremely tight. The government made this announcement in July. The NTA called for funding on the 28th of July. The local authorities made their submissions about a fortnight later on the 14th of August, and the NTA allocated the funds a week later on the 20th of August and required the works to be completed by the 6th of December. So all of that is a, a much tighter timeline than we would uh, normally have to deal with. There's one other thing I'd like to say about the NTA funding as well, is that the NTA always assured us that they wouldn't leave us in the lurch. In other words, if we entered into a contract with a contractor, hoping to get it finished by the 6th of December, but it overrun for all the many reasons that contracts can overrun. The NTA assured us that they would not leave us in the lurch uh, and that they, would, that they would see us good. And that made a huge difference in terms of the approach to the whole process because it meant that we as engineers and implementers could focus on actual construction, not in form filling or on checking budgets. And it gave us the freedom to actually do what we as engineers do best, which is actually build stuff. I want to talk about the public consultation. As I say, we use Section 38, and we uh, have used Section 38 in pre-COVID-19 situations as well. Public consultation is not mandatory. On the other hand, some level of public consultation is best even in these emergency situations. We used web portal the web portal, the council's web portal. We used webinars, including webinars open to the public. Uh, we used meetings. Some of these uh, were on street meetings with local residence groups. Again, at a time when social distancing was uh, acceptable to do that. We were keeping our two meters, um, but we could meet outdoors with residents in, in, in various places. The consultation was uh, covered various groups, the residents in various uh, residential areas where we were doing our work, uh, some of whom were highly negative. On the other hand, some residents groups were highly positive. We used to meet with quite a lot with the businesses and in particular the work that was done in Black Rock was instigated by the business houses coming to us with the ideas about making the street a one way street and providing space for people to queue outside of the coffee shops and the other shops in Black Rock Village. The other business that we had huge dealings with were, uh, was a, a large retail in uh, development in Dundrum, which is the largest rates payer in the county. So it obviously has an influence. And dealing with that uh, Dundrum town centre was very positive. They had, they had serious questions about some aspects of it. They had some very good ideas about some other aspects and we were able to work with them to improve the design that we produced in Dundrum. One of the things that we probably hadn't given sufficient thought to in advance was uh, talking to the bus companies. Again, there's constraints on the bus companies in terms of how they're regulated and the notice that they must give to the regulator of the National Transport Authority and to their customers. If they are changing bus routes because we've changed a street from a two-way to a one-way, they need to give a month's notice. They also need to uh, get approvals for the locations of new bus stops. So all of that needed to be done a little bit in advance. The bus companies were great. There was a couple of incidents where we needed to check out the turning movements. And I think um, Rory and Ben will, will talk about this later. And the buses were able to get a, a bus and bring it with them. Two Dundrum in particular was one where the profile of the road running through a junction was meant that the buses were actually scraping the bottom of the road. We had to reprofile that. And the bus company, again, bought out a bus to check out that it was properly working again. So coordinating with the bus companies from an earlier time, 
than we had originally envisaged is something that I think is a very good thing. Remember the schools as well. Uh, some of the schools were a bit agnostic about the whole things, but some schools, and particularly one school in, in the Black Rock area, was extremely supportive. It's a school where there'd been an active move to get uh, active travel and uh, promote cycling and walking. Uh, and they were very supportive in terms of the implementation of the works in, in Black Rock Village. Some of the campaign groups, the cycling groups, um, were very supportive generally. There were other campaign groups, for instance, Imagine Dundrum, which had been looking for improvements to the urban realm in Dundrum Village for, for years and were supportive of what we were doing. There are two other points I'd like to make about public consultation. One is that the councillors were, were generally very supportive um, and we were all taking risks with what we were doing. We were doing it fast and this was new stuff. And sometimes councillors can be a bit conservative, but in this occasion, they saw the emergency situation. They recognised that what we were doing was taking a bit of a risk, but they were very supportive. And part of the reason for that is because we kept them informed. We let them know in advance of what we were thinking, and what we were uh, coming up with, the ideas we were coming up with. And that, that is crucial in terms of retaining their support. The worst thing that can happen is that if somebody uh, a member of the public sees on social media that we have a particular design that we're progressing in a particular area. And if they meet a councillor who hasn't been told in advance, then that's embarrassing for everybody, not just the councillor, but also for us as an uh, executive of the council. So keeping councillors informed in advance is vitally important to keeping them on side. And that was an important part of the whole process here. The other, another point I'd like to make about public consultation is web-based questionnaires. This is something we had started doing before COVID-19 came to pass, and we continue to do it now. And by uh, web-based questionnaires, what I mean is that previously we might just have put the designs up on the website and ask for people to email in. But what we now do is ask the people who visit the website a few questions. Are they a resident, a commuter, or a local business owner? Are they a car driver, a, a cyclist, or a pedestrian? And then a crucial one, do they support the scheme? Do they support the scheme but would like to see some changes, or do they oppose it? And the point here is that a lot of people who would support a scheme previously would simply have supported it and moved on. Now we are in a position where we are able to quantify that support. And in spite of the fact that a lot of media would give you the impression that whole swathes of people are against a proposal, including some major uh, proposals that are going on both here in Dundee and in Dublin City, when we use the web-based questionnaires, we find that actually there's a majority in support. And that makes it a lot easier for ourselves and for our councillors to carry on with the scheme. I'll just say a quick word about procurement. It was an emergency situation, so therefore we did not require to go through the normal public procurement processes. Consultants that we picked up uh, and used were on a framework, either a National Transport Authority framework or our own council framework, uh, and therefore we knew them and had worked with them before and were able to pick and choose what consultants we worked with. For contractors, generally, uh, we, we would pick contractors again that we would work with and that we knew we would work well with. In a lot of the cases, especially for the jobs under the July job stimulus package, we would take contractors who were already on site and we were able to extend their contracts and therefore they already had their compounds uh, set up and their team set up. So that helped with the speed of delivery. Something that doesn't normally crop up as a major issue in procurement, but it did in this was the uh, materials. The cycling lane defenders and pencil bollards that Rory and Ben will show you in the next uh, section of this uh, presentation, they were in very short supply and not just in, in Ireland, but throughout the Western world. As COVID-19 hit and lots of cities moved to providing extra cycle facilities, these materials became very scarce very rapidly. And the fact that we had put in uh, for procurement uh, early on in the process in the confident knowledge that the NTA would, would fund it um, because they knew that they'd use them at some stage 
but having that those materials and getting an early supply was a, a, a big advantage in terms of being able to get the work the, the work done prop, promptly. My last two slides are about uh, looking forward. Um, and there's a few things I'd say about some of the lessons that we've learned and some of the things that we can build on. The first thing to say is that we're constantly re responding to change traffic flows. That's more so around the Dunleary area, um, but also slightly around uh, Black Rock area as well, changing traffic signal timings in particular to respond to changed traffic flows. All of the works that we did under COVID-19 were described as trials and they were trials. And we genuinely meant that in spite of this, these um, skepticism involved. So we said that they would be reviewed and they will be reviewed. To help with that, there are ongoing traffic surveys. Obviously there will have to be more of them when the COVID lockdown is lifted. We're also proposing to do a socioeconomic assessment uh, by a team in the Technical University in Dublin, uh, formerly uh, Bolton Street. And that will assess whether the impact in particular on traders is as negative as some of the naysayers sometimes say. Now, we were hoping that that assessment would be finished by now, but unfortunately, the ongoing lockdowns have meant that that's not the case. But the trials will be reviewed exactly how and exactly when has yet to be determined, and it's going to be dependent on how the, the lockdowns lift. Just say we are reverting to the norm in terms of public consultation and procurement. It did help in terms of the speed of the implementation uh, to be able to bypass them in some way, um, but there's no doubt that uh, it improves the way of doing things to, to have that public consultation. I would say that one of the longer term effects of this would be that there is an increased openness to the reallocation of road space by both public and councillors. I think a lot of the things that we did would have taken literally years to happen in the normal course of events. And to see the success of those things um, and have that success identified and accepted by councillors and by the public will make it easier to implement these things in the future. My final slide then, again, looking forward in terms of the longer term impacts of COVID-19. And again, I think we all know which direction these things are going, but it's difficult to quantify how far we're going to go. More people will be working from home. It's difficult to say how many more and for how long. More people will be walking and cycling, both for commuting purposes and for leisure. More people will see villages and suburban villages as attractions in their own right and will therefore be more unlikely to go there to visit uh, those villages. For, and that has benefits for those villages if they're attractive. The final point, and it's a, it's a big point, is the increased NTA funding. Under the programme for government, there is a commitment to spend 360 million euros per year for each of the next five years. That's an almost tenfold increase in the amount of funding for sustainable transport versus what it was two years ago or last year. That 360 million euros is a, it's a wonderful opportunity to contribute to a more sustainable travel and to create better places and villages in which to live, work and play. Of course, it has its challenges in terms of being able to implement and spend that money. Now, I believe that there's people here from the NTA in the audience tonight. I take this opportunity to assure them that Dunley Remax Down County Council is totally committed to spending as much of that money as we possibly can over the next five years. And on that positive note, I'll hand over to Rory, who's going to talk about more of the details of how to have the implementation in Dundrum, Black Rock and Daughtry. Um, so as John mentioned, I'll give an overview of, of each of the, the three projects we'll be discussing today and get into the design process uh, in terms of how we went about reallocating road space to pedestrians and cyclists and some measures we took to get these schemes designed in, and constructed in the tight timescale that we have. 
so you can see the location of the three villages uh, we'll be talking about today in Black Rock, Dundrum, and Dawkey. Um, so the, the first step in, in each of those projects was the development and agreement of a project concept. So I'm just going to go through each project individually and how we came up with that concept and, and what it was. So the first project is in, in Black Rock Village. And as Sean mentioned, the concept came from the Black Rock Business Network, who had sketched up a, a one-way scheme for the village, which was actually very close to what we ended up doing. Um, this concept was checked to ensure there were no issues with diversions or access. Um, diverted traffic could use the Frascati Road dual carriageway to get around. It wasn't too much of a detour. There was one bus route that needed to be diverted, um, but that wasn't much of an issue either. So this was able to get the go ahead within 24 hours of the first meeting we had. We decided that this one-way scheme was was a goer. Um, and that line on the screen there is the length of the new one-way system that we put in. So by introducing the one-way system, you free up at least one lane of traffic space, which can then be given over to pedestrians. Um, the next one was in Dundrum, and based on the success of Black Rock, we decided to use the same concept again. It's a, a bit of a similar situation. The Dundrum bypass runs alongside it. Um, so again, we checked for issues with with access this time there were four bus routes um, using main street so it was a more significant consultation um, and it took about a week before we could agree the scheme um, the line on the screen there is the length of the one-way system we allowed two-way access to get into the Dundrum town center and also to the old shopping center but it was one way in between them Um, as part of this, then in order to divert the bus routes, we needed to put new bus stops on the Dundrum bypass. Um, and while we were looking at this bypass, we noted that there were overly wide traffic lanes and a hatch median on the bypass. And um, this meant that cycle facilities could be provided just by simply redoing the line marking and without the need for any major works. Uh, we felt this was an easy win and grasped the opportunity to, to include it within the scheme while we had the momentum. So we did the full length of the, the bypass and the two junctions either side, just with, with road marking. Um, as the bus stops needed to be in place before we could introduce the one-way system on Main Street, we decided to do all the works on the bypass first in phase one of the project and then move to Main Street in phase two. And the, the final scheme for today is, is Dockey Village. Um, we approached the same way again. Let's introduce a one-way system and divert traffic. Um, however, in this case, the diversion route involved residential roads. Um, Convent Road and Carrisford Road would have, would have taken the diverted traffic, including HGBs. And after considering this option, it was not considered appropriate. So instead of a one-way system, we looked at this area of the main street and sought to narrow the carriageway as much as we could in accordance with Timor's and then to give the additional space over to pedestrians. So once the, the concept for the scheme was agreed, we moved straight into the design. Um, survey information was sourced as quickly as possible. If topo surveys were available, then we used them. If not, we went out to site with a tape measure and checked all the available widths um, on the ground. For each scheme, we prepared similar drawings to the one that's on the screen at the moment. The dark gray color is the existing footpath, and these light beige yellow colors are the new space that was formerly road and is now footpath. <clears> the <throat> slightly darker color is the cycle lane. And then the light gray color is what's left over for traffic. So on this example, you can see we managed to get quite a bit of space back um, that was road and we converted over. So on the first iteration of the design, 
we gave it our best guess as to how we should allocate this space and maximizing it where possible. But there was quite a bit of tweaking that could be done allocating the space to one side or the other of the road. So we did this um, in collaboration with the DLR engineers and architects um, to tweak this to get a layout that maximized the use of the extra space that was created. Um, a few considerations um, that we took into account were that we needed to get the minimum width for footways on each side of two meters to allow for social distancing. That was a critical point. Then we looked at locations where people queue on the street, such as outside coffee shops and places where tables and chairs could be put out. These were prioritized to get extra space. We looked for potential areas for public seating or mini plaza type areas. Um, and we tried to get these on the sunny side of the street where possible as people, people obviously prefer sitting in the sun. Um, we had a desire not to create unusable or less useful thin strips of space. Our preference was to give extra space to the other side of the road in those, kind of, those instances. For example, on this side here, we didn't give them any new space, but they had plenty. And we got to keep the existing curb line, which, which, which simplified construction. Um, as Sean mentioned, it was a multidisciplinary team, and this ensured that placemaking was considered throughout the scheme design. Some excellent seating and social areas, as well as trees and planter boxes, were provided on all the schemes. These really enhanced the aesthetics and the village feel that the project was trying to achieve. The architects also prepared these visualizations to help with promoting the project. Um, these were used when advertising the project and online and in presentations to local councillors. This helped to bring it to life more than the, the 2D engineering drawings that, that we used for construction. And here's a few examples of some of the nice touches that, that were included and um, that really add to the schemes. When combined with the larger footways and the lower levels of traffic, um, these really make the village centres much nicer places to be as pedestrians now. The seating in particular has proven really popular for people looking to meet outside during COVID times when we're not in lockdown. Uh, during construction, we also took the opportunity to get rid of as much obsolete directional signage and other street clutter. This helped to further visually clean up the villages and we got any repairs to the roads, footpaths, cleaning of gullies, etc., all done at the same time while the contractors are on site. The scheme progressed much faster than a typical roads project, as Sean mentioned earlier, and I'll go through a few of the key points that helped us speed it up. Um, we bypassed the uh, usual public procurement and consultation um, procedures, um, as it was an emergency um, job. This obviously is not available to all projects, but it was a real eye-opener at, at what can be achieved. The decisions on the concept for each scheme were made very quickly on this project, typically within a week of starting. Meetings were held every few days during the project concept stage to develop and discuss these, and the key decision makers were at all the meetings. This really helped get uh, everything agreed quickly. There were a lot of acti activities carried out in parallel to get this job done as fast as it was. Some examples of this are that engineers and architects worked independently to get drawings done once the alignment was fixed. Materials and contractors were procured before the design was completed. Road safety audits were done while the contractor was mobilized on site and doubled up as a way of design checking. And in Dundrum, we did enough design to get construction started on the bypass first, then design Main Street while the contractors were on site. Uh, the availability and lead time of materials was a key constraint, particularly for the first project in, in Black Rock, where a lot of the design decisions were driven by what materials we were able to get quickly. The rubber defender curbs were in short supply, so flexi bollards were used on a temporary basis instead, just to get the system in place quickly. The road signs that were needed had to be flagged as early as possible, as they also had a 
long lead time. Rather than the traditional tender documents, an information pack given to the contractors just contained the construction drawings and a paired back bill of quantities. We then had a meeting on site with the contractor and the RE where we could point out and discuss everything that was required on the job. This walkthrough along with the drawings was a much more efficient way of communicating what was needed for the construction works in such a short period of time. All parties understood that the design would be ongoing and the changes would be required on site. This was approached in a proactive problem solving attitude and there was a good working relationships between the council's RE designers and contractors. The ability to make quick decisions and design changes on the ground was key to success. Also key to speeding things up was, was constructing the job in, in phases. Here in Black Rock, this shows that the works after phase one had been completed. Already you can see some people are getting comfortable with the new pedestrian space. The reason this was done in Black Rock um, was that defender curbs couldn't be sourced in time. This phased approach though proved so helpful that we copied it on the next two projects, even though material shortages were not an issue. This provided a real life test and was a fantastic design tool that is not typically available to roads engineers. You can see with your own eyes how all vehicle types, cyclists and pedestrians interact with the new scheme and tweak as needed. We moved a few bollards and burned off and redid a few line markings after watching how things were working on site and before installing the final scheme. This is much cheaper than, than changing things after things are constructed. The flexi bollards are a great tool, very easy to install, just simply drilled into the pavement. Um, and you need, have an even easier option that we used in Dundrum was traffic cones. Problems quickly become evident while this trial arrangement is in place and corrections can be easily made to the design. It's particularly useful in urban environments with lots of competing needs for space that need to be balanced. This approach is obviously not possible for every project, but I highly recommend it for schemes that are similar to this one. It was really useful. Um, I'll now stop sharing my screen and hand you over to my colleague, Ben, who'll go into some more specifics of the three projects. Perfect. Um, yeah, so just following on from Rory, um, I suppose the key design, I'm going to start with the key design considerations that we had. So these related mostly to parking, loading and access. Um, so like the main objectives were to maintain the same number of parking spots where possible within each of the three schemes. Um, along with that, trying to optimize the location of the parking to improve the location of parking for disabled user parking bays and um, to include for hybrid parking and loading bays. So these were loading bays that were turned into parking bays after certain hours, which we agreed with DLR. Um, we found that we could you know, make use of the most valuable space in the towns by doing this. And it was ideal for click and collect shopping, which is something that I think we've all experienced now in COVID times. Um, yeah, so and parking in Black Rock, um, we had the opportunity in that project to kind of shift the parking to the periphery of the town and still maintain um, disabled user parking bays right in the center and still be able to provide loading uh, to the businesses that needed it. But it meant that we, we could basically free up and keep vehicles out of the most valuable space um, within, each of the, within each of the villages. Um, so as Rory mentioned, in Dundrum and in Black Rock, we changed the, um, the layouts to one-way one -way systems. Um, it's, it's worth noting that once, obviously, it's a one-way system, um, the turning movements for larger vehicles becomes a little bit more difficult, difficult because they can't turn um, and use the additional lane to make maneuvers. Um, so this is something that we're considering uh, in each of the schemes or in each of those two schemes. Um, the screenshot on the left hand side there is of Dundrum. In the existing scenario, um, the parking is located on the northern side of that photo. We decided to flip it onto the other side because it meant that we could actually meet the, exi the, the existing number of parking bays that were there. Um, 
and obviously create more space because of the number of accesses, which you can see on my cursor there. Um, and it also meant that um, for the contraflow cycle lane that's located along there, we didn't need to provide a buffer between the parking and the cyclists, um, which is obviously was a concern when it was flipped because um, people opening the doors could, could collide with cyclists. Um, so that was the start then, I suppose the, the screenshot on the right hand side shows a portion um, or one of the hybrid parking and loading bays that's located in Docky. So moving on, uh, vehicle tracking was a very important tool that we used for each of the projects. Um, we auto tracked all of the relevant movements. So once we kind of agreed on an alignment, we got straight to it. Uh, BlackRock and Docky both had specific requirements for Dublin bus and for super value truck deliveries. So we we're um, able to get certain parameters um, and dimensions from uh, these companies and input them into auto tracks so we could customize the vehicles and actually get quite accurate simulations of the um, extents to which they needed to make turns. Um, it was extremely useful for checking the horizontal alignments and we use this throughout each of the projects. Um, it was a balancing act really th throughout doing that because obviously you need to provide an alignment that's functional, that's going to allow for these movements to take place but you're also consciously trying to improve the pedestrian experience in these towns and villages. So we're trying to keep the pedestrian crossing points as tight as possible so that there's less of a crossing distance. So we were constantly cognizant of that. Um, in Dundrum, we had no issues with the um, horizontal alignment. As Sean mentioned earlier on, there was one issue with the vertical alignment, um, which was resolved quickly on site um, by the guys. So that was great. Um, so, and again, so this is the screenshot on the right hand side there is of Docky um, and it shows a large rigid truck. So that's the super value truck making that right hand turn. Um, so moving on, Rory mentioned a lot um, regarding the construction phasing. So it was extremely useful for us to be able to, you know, come up with our design, come up with um, the new alignments. But then on site to actually go and check them live. So, and as Sean mentioned, Dublin bus and go ahead bus services came out and trialed them. And it could give us an awful lot of confidence, I guess, in the design that things were going to work. So there's a little short clip here, which shows the bus making a turn. So this is the first project that we worked on in Black Rock. So this is coming up from Bath Place and um, where there's a bus terminal. Um, and there's one of the guys on site straight down to mark out exactly where that was and check it against what we had. Um, it really allowed for, for um, us to maximize the space that we could then give to pedestrians because we could be confident that those buses could make that turn every time. And um, that screenshot on the right hand side is of Docky. So there is now since been a zebra crossing put in place there. Um, and I guess you can see from the extent of the, um, the works, you know, how much we're narrowing that space to, you know, again, enhance the pedestrian experience. Um, so moving on. Um, so this is a typical cross section. So I guess once we had our alignments figured out, once the guys had tested on site, we knew exactly what it was going to look like. And um, we then got to thinking, okay, what were we going to do in the construction stage with the additional space? So this is a typical cross section that we produced for Docky. Um, and this went up on Twitter from DLR. I think I remember seeing it go up and most of the comments didn't refer to the scheme itself, but they referred to the port that was included and the fancy man on the right with the cane and a top hat, uh, which I guess got a few laughs from us. But um, while on site on Sunday, I happened to notice a Ferrari driving by, so I dropped my coffee and ran after it to get a photo. So I'll be sticking this up on Twitter myself soon. Um, so moving on, just a little bit about the construction for each of the three projects. So construction in Black Rock, um, this was, well, the space that we created through the one-way system was delineated using 
colored surfacing, line marking, and the fender curves. So the fender curves are the rubber uh, bolt down curves that the lads mentioned before. Um, so the advantages of this was the rapid construction. Um, things were done fast, um, which was of huge advantage to us. Um, I suppose the main drawback, oh, and the, I guess there was no drainage needed to change um, just because of the way this is built. Um, the disadvantage was the step between the existing footpath um, and the new space. And I guess that the tables and chairs themselves were at road level, which wasn't ideal. Um, we were happy, I guess, once things were on the ground and people were using the space, um, we quite clear, we, we hadn't received any um, you know, notifications. It, it was never an issue um, having to step between the new space and the existing footpath. And there was enough space to, you know, use those planters that you can see in the photo there to kind of give a bit more space to the people sitting down so that they don't feel like they're directly beside the carriageway. So it ended up working quite well in, in Black Rock. And moving on to Dundrum. So the space in Dundrum, again, the one-way system, space was delineated using colored surfacing, uh, line marking, and a mix of the fender curbs and concrete footpath buildups. So, I suppose we got more ambitious as we went along with these projects. Um, we, where we had the full pop buildups, they were successful. So you can see on the left-hand photo there, um, the, the additional space was used extremely well. Um, and there was actually no need to amend any of the existing drainage in Dundrum because there was fairly few gullies um, on site and where we did, um, there, where we did do the concrete build outs, there was a significant slope on the road, so we didn't see the need to change any of the drainage. Um, so moving on, for the concrete uh, footpath build outs, um, a construction technique called dowling was used, so that was in Dundrum and Dockey. Um, dowling provided lateral support for the curbs and avoided the need for excavation of curbs. So again, this was kind of promoting the rapid construction that we we're after, so it saved on time. Um, there's some details there that you can see. So this regard regarding the rebar. Um, yeah, so moving on finally to the construction in Docky. Um, this was our most ambitious project. Um, there were basically the space was delineated by using footpath buildups everywhere. Um, one thing to note, I guess, on this project that the trickiest bit was to do with drop curbs. So where there were existing drop curbs, we had to break up the existing footpath and raise it to the new level. Um, in Dockey, there was existing granite curbs um, that had to be raised to that new level where there was existing drop curbs. Um, the new drop curbs, excuse me, um, the new drop curbs, which you can see in the photo on the left-hand side there, um, needed to be, uh, well, needed to tie in with the carriageway um, and required a hundred mil excavation at that at that point. Um, you can see as well in that photo on the left hand side that there is um, a bit more of a fancy concrete mix, so that had a higher aggregate content as well. Um, we were quite conscious again to provide more um, pedestrian crossings uh, where possible. So I think Dock is a great example where we really enhance the pedestrian and, and disabled user experience. Um, so we're quite proud of that. Um, there's a few photos there. So in the middle of obviously pouring the concrete. So that's at the square about in Dockey. So Muggs is in the background there. So I, I have a couple of photos later on to show that are near there. I think the olive tree actually sits sits there. And then on the right hand side, there's a photo of Dockey at Christmas time, which I think looks really nice. Um, so just a quick little bit about the drainage details. So in Dockey, we did require to, to make some amendments to the existing drainage. There was, um, so I guess the very basic um, diagram on the left-hand side shows the existing scenario. So that's a roadside gully at the carriageway. So flow from the footpath and from the edge of the carriageway will flow into that gully. Where we built out concrete, we provided a lateral connection. So an additional gully out onto the new edge of carriageway um, and a an, uh, fancy eco drain, um, which you can, barely notice in Dockey provided between the two, the existing footpath and the extended footpath. 
Um, so here's just a few photos. So in the middle, you can see the new road gullies. The existing is not shown there, so that's covered. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the fancy echo drains. You barely notice it, and that's outside the square, about where I just pointed, um, where they're pouring the concrete mix. And on the right is just the only little bit of drainage you have to do in Dundrum, so that's your standard echo drain. Um, so just, I guess, a little overview on the project timelines themselves. So it took us three weeks to have the one-way system in operation in Black Rock, and eight weeks from the absolute first day with an inception meeting um, to come to a finalized um, constructed project. Um, Dundrum took five weeks for the bypass to be complete. Um, and then seven more additional weeks after that to, to have the one-way system construction and, and in operation on the main street. And then Docky took 16 weeks from inception to completion. So again, that was our kind of most ambitious project um, with some extra details that I mentioned there. Um, and then just yeah, a couple of photographs. So on the left-hand side is some drum outside the church. I think the photo kind of shows the extent um, of the additional space that we were able to provide, which I think is fantastic, especially outside the church there. Um, and on the right-hand side um, is Docky. So I think the, the new space is a little bit more difficult to see in Docky, but um, if you can see my cursor, where that follows is all new. And if you know Docky, you'd know that people are queuing outside Mugs Cafe there every day. Um, and people, now there's, there's benches and the olive tree and everything there, which are being used quite often, which is fantastic. Um, again, so this is an aerial photo of Black Rock, which I think looks great. Um, and the same photo of Dock at Christmas time again, which I obviously like. Um, so this is just to, to finish up the presentation. So this is just a short, apologies for that. Um, this is a short video that Tunleary wrapped down um, did following the completion of Black Rock, which I think gives a really good overview of the scheme. So I'll just hit play. In Black Rock Village, we're embarking on quite a significant project as part of our response to COVID-19. To deal with the challenges that presents, we're trying to provide a safe and welcoming uh, village environment. We're trying to help with mobility, active mobility in particular, to help support people who are walking and cycling. And we're also, uh, as a major part of this, trying to support businesses as they reopen uh, because it's been a really difficult time for them over the last number of months. And particularly, businesses that are in hospitality, they need more space. So what we're looking at is using that public realm to help businesses to maybe expand and put out tables and chairs and so that they can use that and help, help them recover. We realised that quite urgently we would have to do something with the village. The village needed to be able to respond to the crisis. But more importantly, how are we going to help traders and the community to reopen the village in a way that would benefit everyone in a safe a social distancing way. We came up with a plan that involved introducing a one-way system and turning the focus a little bit away from primarily a village that catered for cars to one that combined catering for cars with catering for the residents, the traders um, and the community at large. Black Rock Village it's quite a nicely spatially enclosed village uh, and now we were changing it into a one-way system and bringing a contraflow cycleway through. But what we wanted to do was to combine that with creating a strong sense of place. So we have tried to soften the impact of these traffic interventions and create a place that people want to stay and linger and have coffee and sit down and so on. So what we've done is develop a palette of materials, putting out benches, uh, picnic tables, and softening the whole street with trees and the the effects then is that people they don't just pass through it but actually they're invited to stay um, and in that way we're actually putting these villages at the heart of our uh, community and our social life. A big focus of the work you see behind me here has been reopening Black Rock Village for all to enjoy for residents for visitors for students for people who work in the village and for traders to be able to succeed as we reopening the village post the COVID-19 lockdown in a safe and healthy way for everybody. And this will be great, not just for current generations, but we're learning now for how to really develop the village for future generations to enjoy also. It's great, it's beautiful. This is what Black Rock needed. All you had to do was to come here over the weekend. I was here Saturday and Sunday on several occasions just to monitor what was happening. And I think the big word I would say is vibrancy. The place was buzzing. Uh, there were people sitting on chairs, eating, chatting, 
no sooner did a group of people leave a bench or a chair than another group came in. It was just lacking in life. The place was just soulless. Suddenly there's a new vibrancy, a new atmosphere has been created. Initially, the scheme has been rolled out as a temporary measure to facilitate social distancing and mobility. However, the intention would be that we will monitor the level of adoption and monitor the impact the scheme has on the local area. And if it works out positively, as we, as we hope it will, um, we will look uh, at a more permanent installation in the future. And, and obviously, depending on the success of this scheme, there's a good possibility it will impact on proposals for future towns and villages within the DLR area. It feels like the way it should be. And it also feels like the beginning of a really wonderful future for BlackRock. Okay, um, so I'll hand it back to Roy. 